This is the debut episode of Stop, Look, and Listen, the GOB Radio Network's interview program. We catch up with William Pruitt to discuss growing up in Africa, his bow tie business, community organizing strategies, and the genesis of his friendship with our own Latroy Gardner at Winthrop University. Today's guest, we have a friend, a brother, a community engagement leader, owner of Acropolis Bow Ties, and just one of the most insightful minds that you can come across. My good friend, William Pruitt, also known as Peasy. Up, people, yeah, yeah. How's everybody doing out there, man? Good to doing, be here. Doing great. How's quarantine life treating you? Oh man, I'm enjoying the lockdown. Definitely, you know, uh, it's giving me a lot more time to reflect than usual. You know, a lot of times it's just go, 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 hustle, hustle, hustle. But now being able to just sit down for days and days on end and reflect, it's a, uh, it's therapeutic. Amen to that. You've always been a deep brother, and I've also been doing a lot of that myself. Just trying to game plan for the rest of 2020 and beyond. Yeah. But I see you got the memo. I see you got the memo. The memo. Bow ties. Yeah, the bow ties. I see that. Absolutely. Well, you know, I wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, I know a lot of the segment that you were doing dealt, dealt with entrepreneurship and, you know, a lot of the people from our collegiate past are on their entrepreneurial journeys as well. So since we're highlighting that piece, you know, I wanted to pull out you know, a little bit of Acropolis and talk about it, you know, how we started where we've been, where we're going. Well, let's talk about it. Even though I wanted to get into it a, a lot more later, let's, let's bring it up. Uh, tell us about Acropolis. All right. Well, you know, um, so I started the crop in 2008. I had an opportunity to go abroad after grad school, you know. Um, so I got, I got my MBA from Winthrop, and I remember going on like a, at least five or six interviews before I went abroad, but as I would go to these interviews, we all looked alike. You know, we all had on the same blue suits, the same red neckties. And I'm sure they were interviewing hundreds, you know, hundreds of people a week, man. And I wanted to make sure that I stood out. And so that's why I really got into trying to stand out, you know, physically through the wardrobe and got into actually making bow ties. Um, and so we started that in 2008 when I was over in China, and we've been doing it ever since. And that's been a beautiful, uh, you know, easily maintained business where I'm able to do both, actually work a nine to five and work Acropolis also. Um, so we're going almost, we're going on uh, 12 years now. Uh, still got the same connect, still got the same plug. Work with a lot of people from Winthrop in terms of the designs and, and the setups and the fashion. You know, so the winter connection stayed true to that. And, and it's been going good. It's been going good. Hopefully it'll last another 10 years. And I can vouch for the quality. I have about 10 Acropolis bow ties myself. Um, William is always promoting deals that are um, economic friendly. So um, at the end of this interview, William will plug Acropolis bow ties and check, check out his website. Um, shout, out, shout out to you too. Uh, you know, I appreciate all the support you've given me over the years, man. Since day one, you know, um, it's been a. Uh, you know, you always want to. You always want to keep your, your value people close. And they always say, start with friends and family when you're starting a business. So, it's definitely much appreciated. Well, speaking of starting a business, like during um, this quarantine era, a lot of people are being creative and they have ideas to. Um, start a business, but they're somewhat hesitant because of a lack of information. Um, would you like to speak on some of the trials and tribulations or just um, tips on how to get uh, a business off the ground? Mm. Well, you know, one of the most interesting things for me, man, when I, when I talk to people is how they always say, you start a business and get rich, you know, start a business and become a millionaire. But honestly, man, entrepreneurship is is one of the hardest roads out there. The majority of biz half of businesses, I would say, that start fail. And even at a time like now with, uh, you know, the coronavirus, we're seeing department stores that have been a, an economic part of America's fabric, man, for over 
50, 60 years beginning to, uh, you know, file bankruptcy and, um, and head down. So, you know, entrepreneurship is tough. I can understand people's hesitancy. I can understand people not wanting to, um, you know, take that journey. So I never, I never tell anyone, yeah, hurry up and be an entrepreneur because I know that it's not that easy, but, um, you know, I'll say this if in all of the, um, the majority of, of my studies and books that I've read, the, um, the journey to financial freedom, the journey to generational wealth usually is based in a, an entrepreneurial vision or an entrepreneurial venture where people actually have their own business. So you have a lot of fear, but I always, you know, Will Smith once said, you got to fail early. And I've always um, ascribed to that because if you're going to fail, now is the time to do it. Now in the time in the midst of a quarantine, maybe while you're still youthful, depending on what you consider youthful. You know, it's best to go all in. Um, some things are trial and error. You, know, you got to learn by doing. Other things you can ask mentors. There are a lot of mentors in the field. In this retail game, um, you know, one of my close friends also owns a retail company, and he started his very close to when I started mine. And we always get together and bounce ideas off of one another just to help each other navigate the entrepreneurial waters. So they're there, the mentors are there, the tools are there, the resources in terms of finances may not always be there, but um, you know, you can learn how to get those if you talk to the right people. You're listening to Stop, Look and Listen. Uh, today's guest, once again, is William Pruitt. Um, let's backtrack to your childhood. So you were born in Columbia, South Carolina, but at an early age, you uh, moved abroad to Nigeria. Uh, could you tell us about that experience and also some of the misconceptions about um, the motherland from those over here in the States? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I, you know, I had one of the, the most amazing opportunities, man. It's really one of the foundations for who I am today. But my father had an opportunity in Calabar, Nigeria, when I was really young, I left it about eight months old. He took me, uh, my mother, himself, we all went to live there. And we stayed there for about 10 years. When I got back, um, I came back and I was in the fourth grade. And so, um, you know, we stayed there a good while. But Africa was amazing. You know, all of the things that I had heard, all of the things that, uh, you know, people would say about Africa when I got back, it was shocking to me. Um, you know, we lived in pretty respectable digs, you know, uh, you know, I think we had like a five bedroom house, you know, it was just a great time absorbing the culture, absor absorbing the languages, the food, the dialects, everything was good. But when I got back, you know, that was, that was truly the struggle because um, a lot of people were watching National Geographic. That's when it was really popular around 89, 90, um, you know, and they were seeing the more indigenous regions of Africa. And, you know, the, the term that was really, uh, the term that was really popular back in the day was something called a, an African booty scratcher. Troy, I don't know if you remember that. Oh, but. definitely. <laughs> that, would al that would always be one of the comeback lines in one of those snap battles. Yeah, that was something that, that, was something that was really popular that people used to say all the time. You know, they would ask me things like, did I live in huts and did I ride animals to school and, you know, and all kinds of things. And, and no matter how hard, no matter how much I tried to articulate to them that Af Africa wasn't that way, you know, and it was a very prosperous, rich, resourceful, con um, resourceful continent. And Nigeria right. was, was a resourceful country. Uh, you know, it was just hard for them to get. Uh, and so eventually I stopped talking about it. I stopped telling people um, that I was from Africa. One, they didn't believe me. And two, if they did believe me, they didn't understand, you know, everything that Africa had to offer. So around the fifth and sixth grade, I just stopped telling people that that was part of my childhood. But now I hope that people are starting to realize the value in the continent of the motherland. So have you been able to return to Nigeria as an adult? I have not made it back to West Africa. It's on the to-do list, actually. I would like to do it either next year, whenever this whole quarantine is over. I have a desire to go back to, um, to Ghana, not Nigeria. But um, I have had a chance to go back to South Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, South Africa about three years ago, 2016, maybe 2017. Yeah, 2017, I went to Johannesburg and I went to Cape Town, which was also an amazing experience. 
So do you think like um, Africans that end up um, relocating to the United States, do you feel like there's some sort of um, divide between them and um, African Americans? Uh, well, I don't know if I would say there's a divide per se. I think we all have our different tribes. You know, African Americans in itself is a tribe. Um, and so, you know, there's always going to be a level of um, distance between people in different tribes. The tribalism is a thing that's been a part of America's, part of the world's fabric, the world's history for, you know, since the beginning of time. And I don't think that it's anything in terms of divisiveness. You know, I hear a lot of sentiment about Africans being racist towards African Americans and vice versa. But, um, you know, I just think that there's a certain level of, of camaraderie, certain level, a certain level of um, likeness amongst different tribes within African America, within Africans. Even if you go over to Africa, they have different tribes there where there's not necessarily a disconnect. Um, just differences. And even in what I do now, you know, I think it's very important that we focus on diversity and what keeps us connected versus what keeps us disconnected. Great point. Listen to Stop, Look, and Listen, presented by the Good Old Boys Radio Show. Uh, this is Latroy Gardner. I'm joined by William Pruitt. Now let's transition a little bit to when we actually crossed paths for the first time. And it was on the campus of Winthrop University in Rock Hill, South Carolina, circa 1999. Yeah, yeah, the good old days, right? Yeah, I, we, we were throwing some L's up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I still throw that up, man. That was, uh, you know, that's an experience that, you know, when we went there, you know, being a LEAP student was something that I think a lot of people wanted us to be embarrassed about. Right. But, uh, you know, the, the more I learned about LEAP, the more I had a chance to experience it. You know, I, I truly I truly enjoyed what it was and what it did. Yeah, I felt like um, it so, sort of put a battery in our back early on, whereas a lot of people, a lot of um, students came in and they couldn't adjust and they started partying and um, kind of going on the wrong track early, whereas we had to come in to the game, you know, prepared, and we sort of had a head start adjusting to college life. Yeah, you know, um, you know, a lot of times I, I was frustrated actually. I did, I did not think that I needed to be a leap student coming in, and I, I was, I was very, uh, I approached leap with, with a negative attitude. But what I learned in leap were, were study skills that nobody taught me in high school. You know, nobody taught me in middle school, but the ability to be able to study the way that they taught us how to study in LEAP, something that, I've even, that I used on throughout education, even on throughout grad school. And so I think that first, um, you know, the start, the foundation that was laid in terms of academics and the LEAP program, I give it a lot of credit uh, for where, where I ended up academically. And I think where most of us ended up academically. Um, you know, Winthrop was a, was a rigorous school. There was no coming by and sliding by and skating by at, at Winthrop. And so a lot of people didn't make it out. You know, there were a lot of people who didn't, weren't able to complete those four years. But I think LEAP students, it would be interesting to go back and see the graduation rates of LEAP students and actually see what they, um, what they are in comparison. But LEAP, LEAP was really a good foundation for me personally. All right, so correct me if I'm wrong. Hey, we, be, we became cool... Um, in the records and registration line when one of our homeboys, Ronnie Wilson, had his name and address called. It was like Ronnie Wilson from yeah. 10th Fatback Road. Yeah. And all of us heard, heard Fatback Road and started laughing and instantly um, gave him the nickname Fatback. Yeah, was, shout out to Fatback, man. No. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah, you know, um, that whole crew, man, we it, it'll never, you know, we can never duplicate that, man. That was a family that that I wish everybody in college could experience. You know, all four of us together started in LEAP. I remember when you were, uh, we all were living in Margaret Nance for the summer. I even remember Vince. Vince was a part of the original crew. You know, you, right. I, 
Octavius Burge, Ronnie Wilson, Roger Copley. Roger wasn't a LEAP student, but he was always in Margaret Nass with us during the summer while we were there doing our two week orientation. But yeah, man, you know, that bond that we formed as freshmen, to see us still together today, you know, even mm -hmm. meet that homecoming last, last homecoming, man, it's, it's, um, they say college friends are your best friends when you make them. So that's, that's a, a relationship that, you know, I've always tried to keep up. It's, it falters every now and then just because of responsibilities and distance. But yeah, but I just, I had an opportunity to see Fat back uh, maybe a few months ago. He came down and we've been cool ever since, man. We've been cool since 99, going on a- Over 20 years. Yeah, 20 year friendship, man. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen all of them within the last five or six months. Uh, Fatback came up here to my house in February to hang out. Um, really? Oh, yeah. And then, like, me, you, and Roger, we've been on video chat several times. We're talking, talking about, you know, business ventures. So, I mean, the, the relationship is, I love where we're at. We're all successful in our own right, but if there's an opportunity for us to collaborate, it happens. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. it, it's always an amazing experience to make money and uh, continue to grow with those that you know and trust. Absolutely. I just, you know, I think we went up to New York last summer. You went up one one month and I went up the next month and got the, got the kicker with Raj. So, um, Everybody's doing well, man. Everybody's doing well, and that's that's good to see. It's good to exactly. hear. Exactly. I mean, I don't know if you remember this. You almost killed me once. <laughs> uh, we'll go with that. We got to talk about that. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. I remember that, man. You know, I was. I don't know why. I don't know why you were running behind the car like that, though. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know. I don't exactly remember why you were running the, running behind the car, but I do remember you running behind the car. I don't know why I didn't stop. I think I, I think we were just out there, you know, being wild. Goofing off. Yeah, I remember when Tay was out literally having a foot race against, uh, you know, people's car. <laughs> you know, it's you know, it good times, man, out there in the front of Richardson. You know, he was, uh, I, I do remember that night, though. I remember, I remember you running behind the car. Well... <laughs> We were about to go somewhere, and you had the doors locked. Everyone else was already in the vehicle, so I might have been talking to someone, and then you might have ran out of patience. It was like, dude, hurry up. So I, I tried to open the door, and you still had it locked, and then you started taking off, and I still had my hand on the door handle, and you, you were speeding up, and I was running because I used to have, have good speed on me. And eventually, I couldn't keep up any longer. And you took off, but my legs couldn't stop. So eventually I lost my balance, but my oh, you stop. Didn't fall. Huh? Did you fall off? Yeah, Did I rolled fall? down the street. <laughs> oh, I apologize. Man. <laughs> my, my stop, drop, and roll technique came in handy, you know? I remember that, man. I do remember you running, but I didn't know you fell, man. My bad, man, you know? Then y'all got out the car and started laughing. An old sad, yeah, I had to check on you, but it was an old sad in 20. <laughs> Maybe the door was broke or something, you know. That was the what year was that? It might have been a 96 sad, and I believe, yeah, because you was the only one that, that was able to bring your car on campus as a freshman, I believe, out of all of us. Yeah, I had my I had a Nissan Sentra, man, that my second second semester freshman year, yeah, yeah. Brought, brought it up. Liberating to have mm -hmm. that, we really didn't need it because we never left the yard, right. Much different than today's times. Mm -hmm. So I also remember you being an introvert, but you would always challenge challenge the thoughts of others, which I respected. And um, after seeing some recent events where you, um, you know, had a call for justice, it just took me back to being inside of the dorm room of Richardson, where you was a militant in the making. You was playing dead prez on a regular basis. So when did your your passion for like community engagement um, when did that start? Was it in college or um, was it ingrained in you from from birth, like your parents being active in the community? 
Uh, well, I got to give a shout out to my pops. You know, my pops was active during the civil rights movement. Um, he actually got blackballed in Memphis, Tennessee, and was, was unable to find employment there as a result of his activism in the civil rights movement. But I've always um, just enjoyed that, enjoyed organization in terms of, you know, pushes for, pushes for social justice. Even when I was in high school and there were things that were going down that were racially charged, you know, I always enjoyed just being in the midst of that. Um, you know, I, eventually, like you said, I, I am an introvert, as they say, you know, and so being out and socializing is never something that I would say I enjoy doing. And that makes it hard. That's what made it hard in terms of trying to be in the community and organizing, but not necessarily wanting to be out around people all the time. And so I've always been, you know, in leadership roles. I was in leadership roles, especially throughout college. But, you know, that was an eye-opening experience that maybe leadership is not for everyone. Maybe everyone is not supposed to be a leader. Because leadership is tough. I said, you know, back then everybody was eager to print out their business cards and have CEO on them. And, you know, people are going around, even in rap music, calling themselves kings and bosses. And I'm just like, you really don't know the the weight of being a leader, you know, heavy is the head that wears the crown, as they say. Right. But I did know that I always wanted to be involved somehow in making change. You know, even with, and Dead Prez was always motivating me because I always, coming up in, you know, in South Carolina, you know, I used to go to school with people who would wear Confederate flag apparel all the time. And back then, in the, you know, in the late 90s, it wasn't as fiery as it is now, but you know, it always did catch catch our eyes. And we always knew that racism was a part of things that went down here, you know. Um, and so I, I never, that never did sit right with me. And I enjoyed Dead Prez's music back then because they were ones who really were militant about it. Uh, you know, and I had an opportunity to do music with them. You know, that's one of the highlights of my music career is being able to work with Dead Prez on my first album uh, and release a song with, with Stickman from Dead Prez. But I'm always going to be involved in some facet of pushing for social justice, even if I'm not, you know, the face of it or out there as the mouthpiece of the, the mouthpiece of the movement. I always have to find a way to stay involved because that's what I'm passionate about. And um, I'm passionate about change coming and the empowerment of, of marginalized people in America. Yeah, and we're seeing far too many of us, you know, falling victim to um, driving while black, sleeping while black, running while black, standing in front of a convenience store while black. Um, with your recent um, experience uh, speaking in front of, what was the building you were speaking in front of in Columbia? That was Sydney Park CME Church, one of the okay. uh, historic church here in here in the city. All right. So, so tell me, is it difficult to get a community engaged to um, fight for equal rights and justice? Is it easy, or or do you feel like um, we have reached a breaking point and we're ready to? do things by any means necessary? Oh, man. I think it's enormously difficult to try to get a community to organize these days. And that has nothing to do with um, the apathy in the community. I think there are a lot of people that are now maybe even more conscious than we were back then of the injustices that are happening. But, you know, we have to give the new wave of technology, you know, it's, it's credit, if you want to call it credit. Uh, now activism looks different, right? People can just, and that's what happened in the Ahmaud Avery case when the, like I, like I said when I was speaking, uh, the attorney Lee Merritt said it was the, the public reaction that caused the shift in the case. You know, when young people are now posting on social media and they're seeing, and the media is getting wind of the fact that a large majority of the population has an issue with this particular incident. You know, I think that is what some people look at today as activism. You know, I think the days of old organizing where we march and we protest, you know, those are becoming far and few between. 
Um, and now activism and protest and community organizing looks different. If you want to look back, you know, historically during the civil rights movement, you had tons of organizations that you could be a part of. There was the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, I'm sorry, with SNCC, then the STLC, the NAACP. You know, there were a lot of movements that you could actually get involved in, but those types of organizations aren't as popular today um, as they were back then. And so that makes organizing much difficult, much more difficult. Any suggestions on how to um, improve on the difficulties with getting new organizations off the ground? I, I see Black Lives Matter, but um, is it going to be focused on a social media driven platform or are we going to see more um, like protesting, like walking the grounds? um type of a movement yeah you know i think that's the million dollar question because uh, you know i think that an agenda has to be developed first and we always wonder what that agenda is i heard it said once very eloquently you know that we're saying black lives matter black lives matter um but we have to make sure that we're not saying black deaths matter because it seems like the only time that we get charged up and motivated to get out there is after a, a you know an african american is killed by the hands of you know police or or someone else and then we start shouting black lives matter but you know we might be saying black deaths matter instead and so i don't really know what organizing um in terms of social justice will look like in the future i don't know if the protest and the marches get the type of results that we would like. But I think that in terms of organizing, I think the African-American community in particular, um, if the impact that it wants to make is through the government, I think we have to do more in terms of getting lobbyists on our side to push our agenda. You know, I think a lot of communities have lobbyists that they're able to use to get their, you know, their uh, issues at political tables where change can happen. And so if we have the resources and we leverage those resources and we are lobbying for change, I think we'll be much more effective that way. Um, because protesting and marching, it's a very symbolic gesture and very important gesture. But uh, as we've seen with all protests, they had an agenda. And more importantly, I think the majority of protests work when you started hitting people financially. So you look at Martin Luther King's um, bus boycott, the Montgomery bus boycott, that was hitting people financially. You look at the sanitation strike, the sanitation worker strike in, Me in Memphis, that hit people financially. Um, you know, you look at the pocket strike out in Chicago when they were um, giving unfair lending practices to black people, that hit people financially. And so I think still black, Amer black America can organize some sort of financial recourse for the injustices that are committed against them, and then organizing is going to look much like what it looks like today on social media. You're listening to Stop, Look, and Listen with Latroy Gardner and our guest today, William Pruitt. Now, you're a father um, of two sons. Mm. Like, how do you, as a parent, um, explain what is going on? like with the murders of uh, Ahmaud Arbery and a Breonna Taylor, Eric Garner, uh, Trayvon Martin. Do you explain it to them? Do, do you explain that um, we're not on an equal playing field? That uh, every day you wake up, there's a chance you will be racially profiled? Uh, or do you shield it from them as far as um, allowing them to think that all police is, is okay, that they're, they're going to um, do right by you during a routine traffic stop, or they're gonna let their personal prejudice um, lay aside and, and not automatically assume that because of the, of the color of their skin that they're a threat. 
Like, how do you navigate those waters? Right. So, yeah, I'm a father to a five-year-old and a three-year-old, and I haven't gotten there with them yet. Uh, so right now, I try to focus on a lot of the the positivity of being black. And we talk, uh, you know, we have a homeschooling segment that now that we're quarantined and locked down, that I go through with them called um, Black Inventors, Black Brilliance, should I say. And Black Brilliance, we go over a lot of the Black Inventors. Recently, we went over Lonnie Johnson, who was the inventor of the super soaker. And so we go over a lot of those types of things and we go over a lot of the positivities in culture, the music, the food, the dance. Uh, right now at this age, that's more what, that is more of the story, the picture that I would like to give them. I think when they become of age where, uh, you know, things like that begin to get threatening, when I begin to worry about um, their safety outside of what I can provide them when it comes to police and when it comes to interaction with uh, you know, just people in general. Um, then I then I'll step into the realm of how to carry yourself, or how to protect yourself, or you know how to make sure that you're doing the things cautiously when you're interacting with people. But at three and five, I don't really want to. I don't really want to raise them in a culture of fear. You know, um, so I'm not giving them that yet. But we'll have to get into that. I think that's the harsh reality of every Black American here. Mm. Wow. So on that note, uh, do you have anything you would like to plug? Uh, any deals on um, Father's Day for Acropolis bow ties? Uh, where can we find Acropolis bow ties? Yeah, y'all y'all go on the website, man. Check us out. It's Acropolis, A-C-R-O-P-O-L-Y-S-S dot -S com. Uh, you know, we're always going to have deals going. Usually the you know, there are promo codes and coupon codes posted right on the, the homepage of the site. Go in there, check us out, fill it out. You know, we ship orders out quickly. Shipping is always free. So, yeah, come check us out. Visit us. You know, we look forward to hearing from you. Well, I, I just want to say, first off, I'm proud of you, my brother. It's always, it always makes my heart, you know, warm to see someone that I've, known for over 20 years and watch your ascent and become not only um, successful professionally, but an amazing father, husband, and just a cool brother. So well, I, I sincerely appreciate it, man. You know, um, thank you for, for giving me this opportunity to come up here, man. I'm sure you had a wide array of people that you could choose from man and it, it means a lot i definitely am, i'm humbled by it you know like i was i was thinking before this i remember when you were always you always had an affinity for radio i remember when you used to make mixtapes you know on old, on old cassette tapes in the dorm room you know and right. we would, would go mixtape after mixtape and you would have the instrumentals for us to freestyle to you know for like hours and hours back when we used to have cypher so it's also been good to watch your transition in radio and, and with the good old boys network and uh, you know how you all have grown that platform and stay stay with it man because this it's it's also what at least 15 to 20 years old it's been tw well i created the good old boys radio show um my senior year so that was back in 04 and then we brought it back in 2009 so yeah it's been 11 years you know going strong consistently I go, I know that podcast and radio programming, everyone is trying to venture into it, thinking it's easy. It's not. Like mm -hmm. people feel that um, they can just pick up a microphone and talk and be engaging and have something to say every day or every week. No, uh -huh. it's not that easy. Um, <laughs> it's not built for everyone. Trust me. Um, and yeah, ha I still have those mixtapes in one of my bedrooms to this day. So I might, that might be one of my projects um, during this quarantine is just going through them because I still have a tape player somewhere. So Really? I've been trying to find a VHS player for, for weeks. I think I'm going to actually try to get what's on VHS put on, on DVD. But yeah, no, man, that, that's true. And I'm glad you plugged that and let people know it's not easy. The same thing I was saying about entrepreneurship earlier. You know, it seems easy to just start a business. And people say it all the time, right? Go out there and start a business and become a millionaire. <laughs> but, it, you know, the struggle that goes along with that, the sacrifice, right. you know, 
financial contributions you have to make. It's definitely a journey. So I'm proud of y'all too, man. Proud of you and being able to keep this up for a decade plus. Yeah, I'll just say I'm never one to toot my own horn, but I never imagined like being a three or four year old, you know, staying at my great grandfather's hole in the wall club at night sometime drinking barbecue, I mean, drinking um, grape soda and eating barbecue chips and listening to all of the juke jams to 30 years later having a show that's heard in six continents. So, I mean, it's, it's definitely humbling. Like a wise man once told me, sometimes you have to decorate your own Christmas tree. Nothing wrong with tooting your horn sometimes, let people know you're around. But that's impressive. I didn't know you all went six continents. I mean, there was a time where we were on radio stations in Belize, Japan, Germany, um, all over London. Uh, we were on stations, not just a podcast. So, um, yeah, it's been, been one heck of a ride. Is that what you would like to get back? I mean, ideally, how would you like to see it all play out? Well, we, we sort of wanted to take more control over um, the content. So we, we're um, going the route of self-distribution um, mm. and having everyone come through us as far as uh, listenership. Nice. Now, if the right opportunity presents itself, say like Sirius XM or um, terrestrial radio, they offer us a sweet deal. To, um, I'm open. Yeah, I was wondering if a lot of people in radio right now, you know, have the role models that they look up to, like the Breakfast Club or you know, Big Boys Radio. If that's what they aspire to be, something on that level. I mean, it is sort of some. It's somewhat difficult to um, receive those opportunities nowadays, especially with how um, terrestrial radio. Um, is with like Breakfast Club is on iHeart Radio Media, and they own the bulk of uh, the radio stations in the country. So, if they're on seventy-five percent of iHeart um, radio stations for uh, hip hop and R and B, then that's taking jobs away from you know the No Limit Larrys of the world. So it's almost better to just do it your own way, kind of like how we're building it. It's, al it's almost similar to the recording industry where nowadays the best way is to get on YouTube or, or shop your music yourself and yeah. blow up on your own and then wait for uh, the right deal from a major. And if it doesn't come, just continue to be independent. Yeah, work independently. Yeah. You know, that's, that's also one of, you know, the, I know we, we're out of time, so I'm going to go ahead and shut it down. But working independently is also one of the challenges of organizing, man, because we've grown into a society that works independently. Uh, you know, it sees the value in that. And teamwork is, is fading. You know, people working collaboratively, I think, personally, is fading. And... I mean, just think back in the day, that's all we used to hear about, right? Teamwork and team building and team building exercises and working together as one. But these days, you know, individuality is what's prided. Remember back when, if you, if you even look at musically, it was so many groups. Uh, you know, Wu-Tang had like hundreds of people and Goody Mobs and Outkast, you know, there were uh, three, six mafias, eight ball and MJG, you know, you had groups. And not even lyrically, um, musically, everybody wants to be a, a solo artist. Right. And, and people want to be individuals and, and prove that they stand on their own too, which is a good thing, but it makes organizing hard. But I can see the value in that as a business approach, because if you're not independent, then you're dependent on someone else and they can control everything you do. So right. it's interesting coin. But yeah. No, thank you for having me, Mr. Gardner, aka Black Trump. You know what I'm <laughs> <laughs> and it's been a it's been a pleasure, Peasy. Thank you for checking us out on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe for more great content. And don't forget to check out our website at gobradionetwork.com.